Okay, so afternoon everyone. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today has been touched on already, so that will mean that I can get through it pretty quickly and we won't run behind. Um, but yeah, just quickly, personally I've been sort of eating in a low carb, high fat way for probably over a year, um, you know, well, close to two or three years really, and lost a fair bit of weight. And like uh, I think it was Gary alluded to, a lot of us have come to this from our own personal perspectives. And as a GP, I thought, you know, I, I can go along and just do what I'm meant to do with patients, or I can sort of talk about this as well. And yep, it can get me into trouble, but I, I just think it's unethical to not when you know what you know now, not to give the right advice. So let's just talk about some of these things. So I'm just going to touch on what LCHF is. I think everyone knows already. Some of the diseases of civilization, what inflammation is, what are some of the mechanisms of inflammation. Some of the, the factors in, in diet and nutrition that um, promote this, and then we'll just retouch on those diseases again and see how it fits in with the model. So I've seen similar pictures to this already and uh, <laughs> we all go on the same side, don't we? Um, <laughs> and I like the way Grant talked earlier in his talk about how you can show this picture to different people and they'll come up with their own label and we use LCHF today but it can be a Mediterranean derivative, it can be whole foods, whatever you want to make it. So. Some of the diseases of civilization or, you know, disease of, you know, the Western world sort of fit into this paradigm. And a lot of these things we initially thought, or initial thinking was, okay, obesity or being overweight is a risk factor for all these sort of things. Obesity and overweight is caused by caloric surplus. So to reduce the risk of insulin resistance, fatty liver, atherosclerosis, all these things, all you got to do is fix the obesity, and that's simple. It's just maths. It's, you know, eating less, moving more, and if it hasn't been working, it's because the patient hasn't been doing it. So, obviously, that hasn't worked. So, we'll just digress for a moment and talk about inflammation. So, it comes from the Latin word to set fire to, um, and it's part of a complex biological response of the vascular tissue to harmful stimuli. And that can be anything from infection or injury, um, and it's very closely regulated by the body, and it can be an acute and a chronic form as well. And it's reliant on a lot of cells, which I won't sort of go into, but leukocytes and cell-derived mediators, including cytokines, chemokines, and, and, and more, um, they play an intricate role in, in the inflammatory process. So this is a picture here of, a, of what they call paronychia, which is infection around the tip of the fingernail. Um, it's quite a painful condition if anyone's had it. The best way to fix this is make an incision with the scalpel where it's yellow and let all that pus come out, which I've done many times. <laughs> Not on myself. Okay, so you often hear about acute inflammation. So, again, it's triggered by tissue injury, so trauma, heat, burns, toxins, chemicals, or, again, by infections um, from various pathogens. And there's... There used to be four, but you can call them five, you know, sort of classic signs of acute inflammation. That's heat, redness, swelling, um, pain, and uh, loss of function. And that really is to help that process. So that swelling and that redness and that heat is to let all these um, mediators, cytokines and leukotrienes and everything, get into the place where they need to do their job and help with, this, help with the, um, the healing process. And the pain and loss of function is so you know there's an injury there, you don't, you know, you roll your ankle, you don't want to walk around on it, so that pain and swelling stops you from doing that. So another diagram here shows you get an injury um, and then it starts a cascade of events and basically it keeps all the, the dead stuff and the deranged tissues in the one spot and helps, helps the body um, process that. So you bump your knee on a coffee table or shin, rather than all the damaged cells spreading all over the body, the inflammatory, the bruise, keeps it all in that one spot. There's a little bit of difference with uh, chronic inflammation, however. Um, one, the mediators involved are often different. And if you, if you think of acute inflammation as this big burning flame on the uh, left-hand side of the picture, chronic inflammation is more like a sort of simmering <laughs> flame that never sort of dies away. So it's not quite that obvious pain you get from smashing your leg on the coffee table, but it's this 
internal sort of sort of um, picture where it's simmering away. So you can get um, cellular stress and malfunction that can trigger this, and, and it doesn't benefit health like acute inflammation can. It actually uh, contributes to disease and age deterioration, and there's quite a few mechanisms that it can do that through. Um, so that diagram on the right sort of shows you get an acute insult, lead to acute inflammation, you can remove it, is a damaged slight, you get resolution. However, if it's a chronic insult, and if the damage is great, you lead to uh, chronic inflammation and fibrous repair. And I think that's where nutrition comes in. And we've seen it with smoking and cigarette smoking. You've got this chronic inflammation. It leads to these diseases. But people in the medical field, we don't often think about nutrition in this sense that it can lead to all these things. So on the left, I've talked about some of the mechanisms there that I'll just touch on in a little bit of detail. Um, so glycation and, um, and age is basically... Uh, in the, in the, we've heard a lot about HbA1c and glycated hemoglobin. And why that's useful for diabetes is that you know the red blood cell has a short, short lifespan, you know, 90 to 120 days. And other speakers have already discussed how the protein section of the red blood cell and the glucose attach. And once that happens, uh, you say that that um, that glycation occurring, and that can happen not just to red blood cells, but can happen to all the cells in our body. So over time, you get this uh, advanced glycation end products that build up and build up, um, and that can lead to um, a whole range of uh, inflammatory processes and release of inflammatory cytokines and growth factors. And you can get into this system where you're having um, increased um, inflammation throughout the body. And you, can use, you often see that in, um, in parts of the body where Glucose is not always dependent on insulin uh, to get into the cell. And where, where, what are the complications that diabetics get? I mean, why do they get the more heart disease, dementia, kidney disease, eye problems, peripheral nerve problems? It's because those cells in the body and those organs can take up glucose through a different transport system that's not relying on insulin. So you get a, an accumulation of these advanced glycation end products, and that promotes inflammation. Also, oxidative stress, which we sort of touched on, the, the mitochondria is a powerhouse of the body that produces oxygen. But sometimes if you overwhelm it or if it's a wrong sort of uh, substrate or a continuing uh, amount of uh, toxins or, or, or chemicals that, that are maladaptive for the body, you can get this buildup of oxidative stress. And you hear about reactive oxygen species and you hear about antioxidants and, you know, you want to have that balance, you know, Often in Western society, you have a, uh, an increase in reactive oxygen species because of the amount of um, exposures that we're putting into our body. And then you probably have inadequate antioxidants because there's less nutrient density in a lot of our foods. Um, insulin resistance, well, I, mean, I think we've covered that brilliantly already today. This little diagram just shows you what happens in, when there's too much glucose and insulin, the pancreas, you know, they get tired and annoyed. And that, that process itself, so that... That's inflammatory, but then the insulin resistance and the hyperinsulinemia are in, in further inflammatory. So you get this vicious cycle developing. Um, oh, I've got this slide that says American diet, but you know America's influence is going everywhere. So even in the developing countries that have this combination of, you know, Gary talked about fructose and vegetable oils and refined grains, and you have these different mechanisms affecting the, the, the liver in, in different ways. And, and the, the liver is a great regulator and of, of um, uh, insulin through its gluconeogenesis pathways and, you know, fatty liver as well can be a problem. So you get this hyperinsulinemia and fatty liver that also contributes to inflammation in the body. Um, this is a bit of a busy slide, but basically it ties it in quite well together. When you lose glucose control, you get age you get inflammatory markers, you get oxidative stress, and then it sort of just cycles around, around and around, and you get insulin resistance, and it just, it just builds. We, also, we always thought fat cells were just a storage place. You know, you just dump that extra fat, but we've learned more, that, more about these fat cells that actually have uh, hormonal effects in themselves, and they release agents that can be pro-inflammatory. So being overweight through these processes further enhances that inflammatory process through a number of different mechanisms and, um, uh, and markers there. Um, fructose, uh, I think we all know about fructose and it can affect 
has indirect and direct effects on, on all types, all, all organs of the body, and you can see there just some of the effects it has and the inflammation that, that, it, that it sort of causes. Uh, the other one is uh, omega-6 acids, uh, omega-6 fatty acids. So it says grains here, but you'll find it in your polyunsaturated uh, oils as well. So this pathway sort of explains how the, the omega-6 changed down to aridonic acid, which starts a cascade of uh, pro-inflammatory mediators. So it's really more important, not so much upping your omega-3, but getting that omega-3 and omega-6 balance right. So you've got the anti-inflammatory markers there, and you've got the pro-inflammatory markers there. So when you bump your leg on the coffee table, you've still got a bit of a defense, but not this simmering flame all the time. Uh, another busy slide, but even some of the gr grain products, glute, uh, gluten and wheat and other gliden, they can interfere with the gut lumen and let um, parts of the, um, you, get, you get more stuff coming through, more bacteria and basically it starts, uh, you get antibody production to these breakdown products of the gut wall and it starts, uh, it's sort of implicated in autoimmunity as well. So it's another way that inflammation can cause a problem. So coming back to what LCHF is, I didn't put a picture up this time, but you know, this is just a guide that I've seen on, on the internet. But if you look about what we don't have there on that side, so the things that we cut out of that diet, or it's basically sugar, processed foods, um, you know, the processed oils, the omega-6, a lot of the grains and starch that can contribute to the uh, autoimmune uh, issue. Um, and if you look at the, the yes slide, it's mainly, like the other speakers have said, we're just talking about real food, whole food. That's nutrition, uh, nu nutrient density is high. And then, again, depending on your carbohydrate um, intolerance or tolerance, some of the stuff in the middle you can sort of play around with and add in, and it's got to sort of be sustainable. So if we go back to the disease of civilization, it puts it in a different light. So often we'd focus on the different components of the disease. So you look at heart disease and say that's a disorder of lipid storage. And then you look at um, dementia or you look at uh, cancer and think it's, you know, it's all different causes. And I'm, I'm saying there's a lot of different factors, but that chronic inflammation that happens from a, mo a certain number of modalities through our, through our Western diet sort of leads to all of these sort of conditions. So it's not just as simple as we get fat and then that's associated with these things. I think what's driving that obesity and what's driving that insulin resistance is also driving all of these other diseases. Um, yeah, that's basically it. So it's, inflammation is a very important point um, in, the, in the process.